Uh, welcome everyone to our Friday night reading in the MFA in Writing and Publishing program at the Vermont College of Fine Arts. We are the only residential program at VCFA and uh, sadly we're in kind of the last couple weeks of the program. It's transforming um, and uh, we're here to kind of celebrate our community, our, uh, you know, our faculty, our visiting writers, our students and alums. Uh, we're so excited to have everyone here um, this evening and we're really excited uh, in terms of the roster of writers that we have featured. We have some faculty members, we have some uh, visiting writers who are returning and some new visiting writers. Um, and we're really excited to have um, with us here tonight, Ruben Casada, who is one of our faculty members and taught a phenomenal class on translation. So I'll uh, welcome Ruben. Uh, we also have Meg Fernandez, um, who uh, gave a professional development talk here a couple weeks ago about you know PhD programs and so on. She's a phenomenal poet and uh, critic and scholar and we're delighted to have her. Um, we're also featuring Erica T. Work, um, who gave a wonderful lecture earlier today in Erin's class and uh, we're excited to invite her back to the program again. Um, and finally we're delighted to feature Ken Chen and Yumna Sh uh, Shalala, did I pronounce that right? <laughs> so close. Um, so uh, two poets that I admire and uh, appreciate very much. And um, I've had a chance to work a little bit with Ken in the past and it's exciting to have you both here in the program. And we're also very much looking forward to your uh, professional development talk in a couple of weeks. So uh, welcome everyone. I'm gonna hand over the mic to Sarah Leamy, our program assistant, and she's gonna tell you a little bit about our readers and introduce them. Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for coming tonight. We are going to start tonight with Ruben Casada, um, someone who actually I took a class with a few years ago in this very same program. So I got to know Ruben a little bit through that, which is great. Um, so Ruben Casada, MFA and PhD, is the author of Revelations, Next Instinct, Extinct Mammal and Exiled from the Throne of Night, Selected Translations of Lewis Sanuda. His writing appears in Best American Poetry, Harvard Review, American Poetry Review, and elsewhere. Casada's teaching focuses on literary translation, poetry, and cultural theory. Casada is the founder of the Latinx Writers Caucus, an organization concerned with the education, equity, and inclusion of Latinx writers in the literary and publishing community. He is co-editing an anthology of essays on Latinx poetry with Natalie Centers Zapico, slated for publication by the University of New Mexico Press. Currently, Casada is a blogger of contemporary poetry and poetics for the Kenyan Review and serves on the board of the National Book Critics Circle. He lives in Chicago. Welcome, Ruben. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um... Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm delighted to be with you uh, all this evening or afternoon. Um, I want to thank Rita and Sarah uh, and the community of the Writing and Publishing Program for organizing and hosting this reading event. I'm, I'm honored to share the stage with these accomplished and celebrated writers um, that I've primarily known through social media. So it's nice to see you live. Uh, thank you all for allowing me to join you. Um, uh, I, I first taught a translation course for the writing and publishing program in, in 2017, and this program allowed me to really explore and expand upon what it means to translate work in order to bridge communities, their language, and cultural understanding. So in this vein of exploring the boundaries of translation or transformation, uh, my reading tonight will be accompanied by a visual component, and this is a recent project and I'm very excited to share it with you all. Uh, I'll begin with a, uh, a quote by poet Luis Cernuda, who was a contemporary of Federico Garcia Lorca, uh, part of the generation of 27. And I'll read the Spanish followed by my translation of it. And uh, the poems that I'll be reading tonight are a combination of new poems and poems taken from my uh, chapbook Revelations, which is available from Sibling Rivalry Press. And I'll pause between each poem. Uh, you won't see me again until the visual component is over, uh, but I hope you'll, uh, and I hope you'll enjoy it. Let's see.
Porque nunca he querido dioses crucifados, tristes dioses que insultan. Esa tierra ardiosa que te hizo y te deshace. Because I have never loved crucified gods, sad gods, who insult that ardent earth that made you and undoes you. In this blood that haunts my skin, in the folds of my brain are burrowed the harrowed words to describe you. Bleak, damned, and when the universe was young, it possessed the means to give you breath, to deliver you to me here, a half-life propped against the wall in the corner of your room where so many worlds undressed, discovering your straw-colored hair, patting your chest, knuckles, and toes. This was our last day together. I stumbled onto the drawn curtain as we watched ghostly orbs carry in the laughter of the neighbor's dog. Outside, children passed as an ice cream truck's siren song shook you back to life from the ghost of heroin. Photographs on the wall ambered beneath the sap-like weight of phosphorus, and what more could the periodic table offer? Already, you were nitrogen, sulfur, even gold. I want to outlive my mother so she never learns of the needles hidden throughout my apartment the way she once hid money from herself for times when she didn't work enough. And I pray that when my body has been wrecked that she'll understand it had nothing to do with her. I don't fully understand why it happened and it would be very easy to stay like this forever. Each night I cradle myself to control the spasms of my legs, and with every heartbeat, my breath begins to drift. I have only ever left this planet once in a billow of thistles after snorting methamphetamine in an abandoned record store, the birds settling into the window sills. A man whom I was engaged to left me to take communion with the Jesuit order in Ireland. From Christ's dress, a thread spun itself into the body of Adam. From out of his palm, the translucent figure of Eve appeared. I never heard from him again. The salmon-colored sky eagerly held the night back long enough for them to recognize their flaws. I would have waited alone a thousand years for the coming of angels, blinding bright as the spring sun to arrive to abandon this world for another. Stunned by their flashing lights aflame across the bow of their spacecraft, landing lights for that world. Herds of animals, horses, humans, and fish fixed. The angels approached. Come angels, come beasts. Men and women cried out to each other. The angels cried. Some were lost between their earthly life and paradise. And what is paradise anyway? Few imagine being bound to this world, blue halo of emerald mountains, extraordinary, ordinary. They rose, a crucifixion yardarm flying away.
Thank you very much. Damn, that was amazing. <laughs> That was beautiful, Ruben. That was a real surprise. Thank you, Sarah. Mm. Beautiful, thank you. Um, next up uh, on my list, as far as I know, is Erica. I believe we agreed that Erica would come up next. So welcome, Erica. Um, Erica T. Worth, I actually uh, came across her article in the Chronicle a couple of days ago, so it was a nice surprise, a nice combination. Erica T. Worth's publications include two novels, Crazy Horse's Girlfriend and You Who Enter Here, two collections of poetry and a collection of short stories, Buckskin, Buckskin Cocaine. A writer of fiction, nonfiction, and poetry, she teaches creative writing at Western Illinois University and has been a guest writer at the Institute of American Indian Arts here in Santa Fe, where I live. Her work has appeared or is forthcoming in numerous journals, include, including Boulevard, The Writer's Chronicle, Waxwing, and The Kenyan Review. She is a Kenyan Review Writer's Workshop Scholar, attended the Tin House Summer Workshop, and has been chosen as a narrative artist for the Meow Wolf Denver installation. She is represented by Julia Eagleton at the Gannett Agency. She is Apache, Chickasaw, Cherokee, and was raised outside of Denver. Thank you very much for being here. Welcome. Thank you so much for that. Yeah, that's a slightly old bio. Um, <clears throat> I am represented by Rebecca Friedman actually now. So yeah, it was a brief and strange relationship with that agent, and Julia. <laughs> yeah. Um, but anyway, um, I just want to thank, uh, especially Rita and Aaron, of course, everyone um, for setting this up and for inviting me. I feel very privileged, as Ruben mentioned, to read with such lovely writers and just privileged to be here again in general, even if in Zoom form. So I'm just going to read uh, three short excerpts from the novel that my agent is going to send out for submission in a few weeks. Um, White Horse, um, which is a poetic um, ghost story. And starting with a section that's like a, um, a short homage to Old Denver from chapter 18. The roller coaster shrieked above us, the sound of rusty metal making contact with more rusty metal, simultaneously exciting and terrifying. The screams of the people in the coaster joining the teeth jattering screech as it came to a pinnacle and plunged. Lakeside was the poor man's Elitches. Elitches, or if you wanted to be fancy about it, Elitch Gardens, had opened all the way back in 1890 on 16 acres of former farmland, the first zoo west of Chicago, relocating to the tune of 90 million goddamn dollars to a brand new downtown location in the mid 90s with rides like the Mind Eraser and Tower of Doom, though I had to admit the Sea Dragon was my personal favorite. Lakeside had an equally prestigious beginning. Opening in 1908, not, not, not long after Elitch's, it was called White City on account of its neoclassical buildings and white plaster of Paris. Unlike its more magnificent twin, which managed at one point relationships with companies as American as DC Comics, Lakeside, like old Denver, has slid, rusting gently into Denver's past, my past. Walking through Lakeside is like walking, is like moving into a bygone era. The beach, casino, theater, racetrack, all marvels in their day, gone. The faded yellow entrance with Lakeside in cursive, yellow and orange sunbeams, sunbeams shooting out of the lettering is peeling, and the building has not been the bright white of the past for many, many years. But my past was still there, a past that belonged in a city that in many ways no longer existed. I had come here as a teenager, my lithe, angry body caught between metal parts, moving up and down in different directions, pinching my arms, legs, my mind swirling with alcohol and promise. Debbie and I had spent the 80s as young girls eating cotton candy and throwing balls at impossible targets shaped like spirals or clowns, flirting with boys with our eyes, lying to Aunt Sandy about where we'd been, who we'd talked to. But it was places like this that had shown the divide between my life and Debbie's. When I hit 13, I was already a woman in body and mind. I was a parking lot kid, ditching and getting high not far from the school in some metalhead's car, 
not giving a fuck about my grades in math or English. But Debbie, only five years my senior, was studious. She was in her last year of high school for my first year of junior high, and though she loved me, she didn't approve of my lifestyle, and in her quiet way, she made it known. There were many years in which she was just my cousin, and what furthered the divide was the fact that we looked nothing alike. Her shy, quiet hellos in the shadows of the hallway, my, oh, she's my cousin, to confuse looks from my friends, were our only interaction for years. So... Um, this next section is from chapter 17, and it's part of what I call the thread of poetic flashbacks throughout the novel that help you to get to know the main character better. And I, I think there's a series of trigger warnings, adult language, obviously, that was in the last one, um, sort of sexual content. There's the R word. I don't like it. I obviously don't endorse it, but it is in here. I am 13 years old when I tell my best friend to get the fuck out of my house. I gleefully popped my cherry earlier that year in the basement of a house on an old mattress, wine sick but ready to get this part of my life over with. I remember there had been a toy truck underneath me as he came. I flung it into the darkness, listening to a child crying somewhere in the distance, sounding lost. Jamie and I were drunk on the whiskey and cokes con from men we'd chatted up in a bar in Denver. We'd hitched one Saturday night, ready for adventures of the kind that could not be had in a small town that sat at the bottom of a mountain. The trees swaying above our trailers, our dingy houses, our wild, furious hearts. We had told the men at the bar that we were in our 20s, and they had laughed and said they'd love to buy us drinks, love to take us home. I'd been drawn to the taller one because he'd been wearing a Guns N' Roses t-shirt, I thought that band had gone a little soft, but they were Jamie's favorite band, and I still liked what this minor metalhead and his friend, who laughed like a donkey, seemed to be offering. What they were offering. Experience. Even at that age, I learned I'd like to work my way in slow, though I was never what you'd call subtle. I knew what I wanted, and they had it. A little cash, enough for drinks, packs of cigarettes poking out of their tight, slightly dirty jeans, the hint of an adventure that held just a little bit of danger. If I was honest with myself, it was especially the last thing. This was the time that I learned to test myself, test my limits, find out what I could do and come back from, what I could do and survive. I decided that we would go home with them when one of them asked me what it was like to live in Idaho Springs. There was something about his tone, mocking, superior, cruel even. Up until then, we've been having a great time bonding over metal, arguing, my long brown hand slamming playfully down on the arm of the man who'd been supplying us with cigarettes all night. I'd been wondering what his thighs look like under those tight jeans, what it would be like to get on top of them. What do you mean by that? I asked, my eyes going flat as a cat's. He blinked rapidly. He was dark-eyed, tall, long-haired. I remember thinking when we first let them approach us that he was the kind of man I would have wanted as a boyfriend if I was the kind of person who would ever want that. Even then, I knew that wasn't for me, that there were some things better left untouched. He said, well, it's just Idaho Springs is full of white trash. Sorry, you're cool though. I closed my eyes then, and when I opened them, he was looking at me like he just handed me something beautiful, like a dime bag or roses. Do I look like trash to you? I asked. He stammered. Shit, I wasn't even white. I lit a smoke and squinted up at him, Jamie babbling nervously in the background, my hand fluttering behind me, trying to shut her up. His friend told me I look like a hot piece of ass. I am a hot piece of ass, I said. He laughed his donkey laugh. You laugh like a donkey, I said. His mouth clapped shut, then a minute later opened again with you trash bitch. I smiled and his friends told us both to cool it, cool it. He said, that's not what I meant and that there was good shit at his place and we should just forget about what he said. I told him I couldn't forget, but that he should remember that trash rejected him. He shrugged knowing it was over. I grabbed Jamie's hand and pulled. She was angry with me, told me to calm down, Carrie, she said. The guy hadn't meant it, that we should go home with them and have some fun. I told her dead-eyed that she'd be going home with them on her own then and stalked towards the exit, smoking as I did. A few minutes later, she was beside me, pouting. I started walking, my thumb out. I told her to have some fucking dignity. She was silent. We found a ride. 
a truck that was going west. It dropped us off at the outskirts of the city, the place where the grasslands began to meet the mountains. And eventually, we found a ride going all the way to the springs. But it took a while, our thumbs out in the dark, not far from the mountains where a boy I had been killed by a lioness, worried for her cubs when he went, when he went jogging, when he went jogging past too close. I didn't speak to her the whole way, just smoked and smoked, glad I'd pulled the pack off the table before I'd left. When we got back, she told me that we should just forget about it, go back to my place, stay drunk. She had some tequila in her bag that she'd lifted from a liquor store. We walked down the empty streets next to the beat up Victorians, the shacks, the shadows long, the kids asleep who went to sleep, the others like us, just maybe getting started. There was something sad and small and yet almost otherworldly about Idaho Springs, like there were secrets in the cold, rocky ground that might spring up at any time and take you down with them into the dark. At my house, my dad was slumped over on the couch, the light of the TV playing over his face. I felt bad. I hadn't been there to get him up the stairs, make him brush his teeth, tuck him into bed. Jamie took one look at him and started laughing. I'd never let her come in. I'd never let anyone come in, but she was my best friend. She was there the first time I had sex, the first time I'd smoked cigarettes, the first time I'd given a blow job, throwing up after, Jamie comforting me and saying that she'd done, done that too her first time. I asked her what was so fucking funny. Would it be my dad who got into an accident and had brain damage? Was that it? Was that what was so funny? She just shrugged. When I told her she was a piece of fucking shit and to get out and never call me again, she looked like I'd slapped her, which I told her I wouldn't if she didn't leave now. On her way out, she called my dad a fucking retard and said I would grow up to be one too. Thank God she called me the next day and apologized profusely. I slammed the door closed with my foot. I woke my dad up and got him to bed, tucking him in as he moaned my mother's name, Cecilia, Cecilia. God help me. I resented him so much in that moment. I resented his weakness. I also promised myself something. I promised myself that this was the last time I'd ever feel weak. So the last section that I'm gonna read is super short and illustrates the more speculative or horror aspect of the novel. The novel includes a kind of homage to Stephen King um, and The Shining is sort of a, a mirror novel throughout mine. I think I was out for a few hours before I heard something at the edge of my consciousness and stirred. I sat up sharply, someone was in my room. My breath short, I tried to let my eyes adjust to the moonlight. I heard a sound, my eyes darted. The hair on the back of my neck spiked. It was coming from the bathroom. Oh shit, oh shit, I whispered, thinking about the slutty zombie from the movie, if you've seen it. <laughs> my eyes adjusted and what I saw, I couldn't fucking believe. It wasn't, in the, it wasn't the bathroom, it was the huge wooden arch in between the bedroom and the bathroom, the Indian carving, the one I hadn't remembered from the book or the movie, the one featuring Apaches, it was moving. I sat up, the figures, both male and female, were looking at me, right at me, and they were gesturing for me to get up, a low whispering in Apache as they did. I'd taken an online course in Chiricahua years ago, and it was close enough to the Navajo I'd heard spoken, spoken growing up around me to know what it was, if not exactly what they were saying but then I heard it. They were saying my name, whispering it amongst other words. Carrie, they whispered. Oh shit, I repeated sharply. I knew what they wanted. They wanted me to come to them. My heart thudding, I got up and started walking towards the wooden figures, praying to Mustaine. She loves heavy metal. My t-shirt, Megadeth is an homage to the novel, um, that whatever they wanted, it wasn't bad. It didn't feel bad. I stood by the arch and the minute I stopped, the whispering ceased and the woman in the forefront of the carving looked right at me and pointed. I followed her finger and there was a beam of moonlight shining directly on a part of the carving. The carving was of a mandala with the four directions, a star at the top, a symbol for water at the bottom, and on one side, the sun and mountains, and then the other, the moon and arrows. Carrie, I heard and looked over. She was still pointing. Following my instinct, I pushed on the mandala and the wood began to, began to separate from wood, the mandala part moving outwards. When it stopped, I looked in. There was something in there, in a hollow space that had been carved out of the wood. I couldn't see it though, it was buried in shadows. I wondered if this shit was like Dune and I'd reach in there and there'd be pain, or maybe it'd be spiders or, Carrie, she whispered. The oval began to move back in and quick, I put my hand inside and felt around. It was an object of some sort and it was stuck. It was long, whatever it was, and made of stone and wood. I struggled to get it out as the oval began to close, frustration circling my heart. Terror that whatever this was, it was meant for me and I was going to lose it. I pulled, worried I'd break whatever it was. 
finally, my fingers curved around the object and pulled it out right as my hand would have been squished under the closing wood. I stared at what was in my hand. It was an Apache war club. Thank you. Thank you. That was amazing. That was really good. Wow. <laughs> that got me going. <laughs> I'll read more, please. Um, thank you. So next up, we have Ken Chen. Thank you, Ken, and Yumna for coming and joining us today. Um, Ken Chen is writing about his travels to the underworld to rescue his father and encountering those sent to the afterlife by colonialism. He is the recipient of the Yale Younger Poets Award for his book, Juvenilia. Juvenilia. He served as the executive director of the Asian American Writers Workshop from 2008 to 2019 a recipient of fellowships from the Cullman Center at the NYPL, NEA, NYFA, and Breadloaf. Chen co-founded the cultural website Arts and Letters Daily and Culture Strike, a, nat a national arts organization dedicated to migrant justice. A graduate of Yale Law School, he successfully defended the asylum application of an undocumented Muslim high school student from Guinea detained by Homeland Security. Thank you very much, Ken, and welcome. Um, thank you so much for that, uh, for, for, the, for <laughs> that kind introduction. Um, I want to thank uh, Rita and Sarah for having us here and um, thank Ruben, Erica, Meg, and um, Yumna, who I've met once or twice before, um, <laughs> for all being here and sharing space together. Um, uh, so as Sarah said, I, I have this um, pastime, which is I journey to the underworld. Um, and I'll just read you a little bit of that. Um, I'll read you kind of the first page that sets up the premise, and then maybe I'll read some things that are slightly different. In the beginning, in 2012, my father passed away, and I began making regular visits to the underworld, which seemed polite. Like most people, I had not previously traveled to the underworld and hadn't really intended to visit more than once. What had happened, what had gone wrong, was my consciousness. In the beginning, in those early days of death, when my memories of my father saturated themselves through my body like a toxic tranquilizer, I find myself thinking about him even when I slept. I do not really remember the dreams if they were dreams, but I believe that the initial dream simply replayed past experiences that my father and I shared. For example, my father and I eating lunch together, indoors, alongside a wall of windows in a sunny restaurant near the California coast. I told this to a novelist friend who said that he had experienced similar dreams. In the beginning, he was devastated to see the one who he had lost. When time passed and the beginning had ended, these dreams would occasionally return and strike him out of nowhere and he found himself gladdened. This was the only way he could again see the one who had died, a thwarting of death. I mentioned this in my eulogy for my father. Time poured by, death became a fact. Death infiltrated my dreams with fact. My dreams would proceed as they had previously, but halfway through, my father would need to leave, would begin to move out of his apartment. He has never lived in an apartment would disappear around the corner, would forget about me, would have never have been there at all. The narrative distorted itself to represent the abrupt rupture of grief. My consciousness, which seemed something obviously separate from myself, had scrutinized what was happening and decided to correct it with the fact. In the beginning of the next chapter of dreams, I found myself inside a windowless gray room, deep inside a large state building stationed across from my father who sat on the opposite side of a visitation booth, an unbreakable window and telephone apparatus between us. And he must have been in jail. He must have been interned at the border between my nation and his nation. He was in immigration prison. He was the migrant held captive at the border of death. This was my first visit to the underworld. In the beginning, when I visited the underworld, I was ostensibly searching for my father but I could rarely see his body. And so in the beginning, I decided to look. I made my way across the highway 
and walked into the city to explore the necropolis, ostensibly searching, obviously failing my impossible quest. I find myself in a large stone building. The ground felt moist. You could smell urine. There were horses shitting within this temple, some bodies on the floor. In the beginning, I'd come to Al-Azhar Mosque in Cairo. I'd come not in a dream, but in a time machine that I'd come to Al-Azhar Mosque. When Napoleon shelled it and occupied it with his soldiers and where the French army and its horses pissed in its sanctified halls. This was not a dream. It really happened. This did not happen since I had not been there 200 years ago. This did not happen since I had imagined the architecture based on the death zone tower in Doctor Who. I walked into another room in this museum mausoleum and saw growing from the stone floors a luscious grove the oranges illuminating the room like lanterns. These were Jaffa oranges. They were here because the trees themselves had been cut down in the nation above. The nation above had been cut down in the nation above. Everything dies, land and places. Was the beginning over? I was now alone and did not know where in this space my father existed. Maybe this meant I was an adult because I was alone. But adults are not alone. They have families, they have friends, and a community, and we call this citizenship. And I was here in a land where I did not belong, a place where I could be sent back from any moment for existing without authorization. I was not authorized to be dead. So, uh, I thought, so a lot of the book, uh, unintelligently enough, involves me trying to read everything about colonialism <laughs> over the last 500 years. Um, so kind of everything bad uh, that happened everywhere. Um, but I realized that uh, at some point that I had to make it not about uh, mourning and something that was retrospective, but something that was speculative about the future. And so some of the things in the book are sort of like, um, like an ode to like what uh, like an anti-colonial movement might be doing right now. And I thought that, um, you know, uh, in recognition, that, like we're in this moment again, that's like the eternal return of Black Lives Matter where there's like, you know, new protests, new horrors, there's the trial happening. Um, I, I wrote this thing that I, I was already writing it and then this anthology came out uh, from Tupelo Press called Four Quartets um, that Waming has bought a copy of, uh, <laughs> but it was not in, meant to be like a, uh, about like coronavirus and the George Floyd protests and things like that. But I was kind of already writing about those things anyways and about how we're in this sort of moment of global death and like global hope. Um, so uh, there's like a part that is about the last year, but also uh, it's part of this larger book and about like being a planetary person or being a Pangean. Um, so I'll skip around, but the overall piece is called By the Oceans of Sticks, We Knelt and Wept. How is it that everyone is dying lately? All headlines transmuted into elegies. Death, the lupine drone, slips free, all fetters, eager to dispense its love. And we read the luminous inscription of names on our handheld 5G gravestones. Doom scrolling, they call it. Swipe right, authoritarianism. The tablet and epitaph that we, the living, bear. We shall go to greet the arrival of new ghosts. And that is how we came to the mortal borderland and saw so many faces we recognized, how we followed the procession of new migrants toward hell. Come, let us greet each soul we pass. Surely this is the least we can do. There have come so many, so many new ghosts that surely we must note them all. Let us not be Whitman of the settler saluting, or shout instead the empire's obituaries read under sallow iPhone lamp. Let us be we, each passing day, the waves of sticks break new ground, spilling out national specters. 
Recite, recite, as we watched the former people washing ashore. We dreamed we saw those beloved dead whose names grew public past naming. A man dozing by the Wendy's drive through A woman slumbering when her boyfriend hears men invading. Did you know even dreaming has been criminalized? The passionate mass of names grows each day, the weight stronger than our finite incantations can levitate. A nightclub bouncer howls for his mother. Does he press his ear to the ground to listen for her shadow's response? No, another man pressed him to the street. He famished him for air. Recite over alerts and pressers past phone notifications and the wet noise of coughs shout over the police who have prohibited even breathing. We shall erect sad mythologies. Let us pour a postscript foundation. Set frame for the astral mausoleum of those who left owning only their names. Oh, how we shall outmason the monuments. Lay down a concrete mixed from the ephemerality of shouts, the chants we exhale so wondrously contagious that our affected flame shall dissolve all statues in the very state. And against the vast unliving quiet of the universe, the force of our size unmoors the earth from its spindle. The planet spools out its fraying thread of days. Arson of Amazon in Australia, Grenfell Tower in Golden State, where they threw hoses at prisoners and led them into the burning forest. Born through air comes plague and pestilential hornets. No, too easy. Too easy to call it apocalypse. Too easy to blame God and eschatology when something even more predatory hunts us, the fellow humans. By the oceans of sticks, we knelt and wept. Once a river, once a wet filament necromantic. Now the mortal border fattens, moist, and inundates, and a newly poured ocean floods the earth. Ocean sticks, sublime floods prowling the deserts. We came upon travelers who walked from dry lands south. They said their names were Rosa and Oscar, and they held their daughter Valeria, not yet two while they walked the intersection of the Rio Grande and Styx. Oscar carried Valeria across and swam back for Rosa. This was when Valeria followed her father into the river. What choice did he have? He leapt into the waters and the current tore them away, stronger than his desperate strokes and weaker than their embrace. Why do we possess a photograph of this? The photograph too horrific to see. Your eyes shun it instinctively. We dream of Oscar in his black skullcap carrying Valeria, for she is still his baby. On his shoulder, she sings and plays a toy guitar. Her songs spill over other waters and drift where neither mother can faintly hear them. We learn that her name had been Rahana. Even as a child, she had feared the water. Kleptomaniac ocean, so greedy to snatch any desperate vessel smothering those sailors propelling towards capital's barricades. She plucks the armpit of her life vest, a fake she now knows. They had overcrowded the vessel in life. At least here, Charon's rubber raft ferries only light cargo, the weight of specters being only psychic. The skiff docks and she sees her child on the shore. Walking on the balls of her feet, she gently lifts her son who had been lying face down on Bodrum Beach. A child named Alan. Obscene image. Have you ever seen a stillness so profound, so profane, your eyes sting? In this place, he stirs, he wakes. What dark sentimentality. And I'll just read a few short things. <laughs> Pre-credit sequence for the film about the camp. You crawled back into your motel in a border near the demarcation line between the nation state of the living and the underworld. Sleepless, you peered out the window. You could see the neon lights garlanding the gates of ivory and horn. 
The lights spelled out open 24 hours a day in blinking red cursive. You laughed. Of course, death is the only border crossing so open to all. You watched the illumination from the street pour over the wall above your bed, a red lasso that looped as if the wall had begun to bleed extravagantly. Below, traffic packed the road in both directions. From the two open gates, dreams sailed into the living world from over the deserts. Some dreams true, some false. You recognized some of these dreams, race, nation, gender, and could not tell from which gate they had emerged, sleepless. You saw the line of pilgrims queued up to enter the underworld. The line seems longer lately, new refugees to the afterlife. Um, at the very end, there's a poem that's like a, a, like a prayer, but not to, a prayer to no God, a prayer to no nation. And uh, it's sort of infinitely long, so I will just read like a page from it, and then you'll never have to hear from me again. Uh, resurrect, a prayer directed to no God. May you mourners in the mourned feel me pouring you my love, a ghost roaming beneath the mounds, and you who miss your ghosts. May you feel this light roaring towards you. See that puddle aspiring in the gutter, miniature lake for the archivist. Don't you know rain only drops a data set from the ocean? The Americas moated by two bowls of unholy water offered to planet history. And then when I walked down Love Lane, I saw the wind harsh ridges into the alley splash and crenellate that spill into a fingerprint. My dear, may you bra brave the startlements of your loneliness. May we both. Remember the self is a sphere. This vulnerable pearl is only a uvula that's accreted a silver glaze from the radiance of other people's love. You who read this, touch hungry, do you feel the skin I broadcast towards you like radiation? What is praxis but an accident? an act of love. Oh, how I thought I was good at love. I'd only been foraging in the dark, gleaning for warmth in the hollow. A prayer, not a spell, since resurrection impossible. No poetry source enough to blow ashes into seeds. May this necromancy trampoline up my father slumbering like a submarine, snug as a snail in hell's muggy canals. Yes. Let this delinquent son song insurrect the other father who is law, God, boss, state. Open your mouth, ululate, sing the heterodox litany. My prayer fluctuates because the light of insurgency redshifts as it flees the black hole swallowing galactic center. Against this lexicon, our lovely Lux. You, silent one, decadent, even your last whispers filched by death, let us sing together. You and I shall sing all who ever blazed, coughed, or murmured, all whom time halted. Let us raise these words as a flag for no nation, this prayer a devotion towards no god. Unflagging, we hoist symbol celestial, Red star, black star, crescent moon, and one more mundane. The which is familiar, a sable cat. The deity to whom we send our words is ourselves. Send a blessing of care for the villagers of Mari. Warn them of the cannibals from the west. Blow winds pushing ships, escaping Andalus. Bless the gourd grenades the Taino lob at Columbus. Send keys for the brass handcuffs of Cal Nebo, Lucayo Sakik of Hespaniola, and transfigure Anakaino's rope into a line to thread her way out of this labyrinth. Watch over those first five stolen at Shama and praise the poison arrows that Kwa Ansa flies over Mina's surf. Praise the Khoisan dismantling Dagama's cross and buoy to the air the flaming ship Miri, arsoned in the ocean. 
Insurgent radio transmitting the vortex. Did you know the encyclopedia simply hoards the obituaries of recorded time? Force open the stall that the footnote erects. Pour out the ghosts of long durée. Necromance all chronicles into songbooks. Now striding towards you, you see the one the English dubbed Jack of Feathers. Nima Tanu, who dons a swan feather crown, the nibs fanning exclamation marks around his head. Had he been surprised, this one who imagined himself immune to muskets when the British shot him? Now the invaders can invent Virginia, but he requests that you tell no one how he died. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was great. Thank you. There were some stunning lines in there, I have to say. There's uh, in the chat, there's people making notes on some of the lines and things that you said. So thank you very much. Um, next, I would like to introduce Yumna Shala. She is the author of the poetry collection, The Paper Camera with Litmus Press 2019. She is the recipient of a 2018 O. Henry Award and a Joseph Henry Jackson Award. Her writing appears in Bomb, Guernica, Prairie Schooner, Bespoke, Asterix, Cura, and MIT Journal for Middle Eastern Studies. She is co-editing a new series for Coffee House Press entitled Spatial Species. Yumna has exhibited her artwork at the Hayward Gallery, the Drawing Center, Rotterdam International Film Festival, Dubai Art Projects, Hessel Museum of Art, and the MAK Center for Art and Architecture. She participated in the 33 Bien Biennial de Sao Paulo, 7th LIAF Biennial in Norway, and 11th <coughs> Performer Biennial. Yumna is the co-director of the Mutating Cities Institute and a pro professor in the Humanities and Media Studies and Writing Departments at the Pratt Institute. So a warm welcome. Thank you very much for being here, Yumna. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Rita and Sarah, and thank you to Ruben and uh, Megan and Ken um, for reading with me tonight and all of you for being here. Um, I think the strange thing about Zoom is that um, it's painful. <laughs> but then people who would otherwise not be um, at a reading can be at a reading. <laughs> so and so it's, uh, it's both this uh, terrible and wonderful portal. <laughs> um, so I, uh, I think I'm going to read a little bit um, from the paper camera. Um, it's a book that um, came out um, a couple of years ago and uh, no, sorry, but, um, and that has uh, at its center um, Beirut. Um, and it's been a little strange for me to have this book emerge um, at the end of 2019 when uh, in Lebanon there were, um, there was a, essentially like a, a revolution that began um, in October of that year. Um, a couple months before the book came out. And uh, that changed the discourse from one of despair to one of really deep um, uh, movement towards transformation. So not just in the city of Beirut, but in the entire country. Um, it actually began the day after um, a kind of fire lit uh, mountainside alight, um, <laughs> as has happened all over the world. Um, so. Um, the country itself, um, and it's 10,000 kilometers, <laughs> um, really kind of um, mobilized and went onto the street only to experience, um, so we can call that, I guess, an event. Um, <laughs> and the event transformed uh, into crisis as the economic uh, situation worsened. Um, and then it transformed into catastrophe as, um, uh, in August of 2020, the country experienced amidst Corona and um, uh, the economic uh, kind of horrors that were happening in the country with people unable to access their own funds um, and uh, inflation. Um, they experienced the biggest non-nuclear explosion ever. Um, so it had, it's like a literal unscalable um, catastrophe. Um, and now 
the nothing's gotten better. <laughs> and everyone who returned um, post-war about 15 years ago left again. So it's very strange for me to have this book out in the world um, because it's like a living, active object um, that is um, that was in conversation with a specific moment in time in a specific place and continues that conversation in variations. And so I'm going to read a little bit from it. Um, and in, in, and within it are these um, these stills from a Super 8 film. So uh, they are meant to kind of think through language as a pause um, rather than an action. <laughs> It is the beginning and end of all things possible. Herds of helicopters move towards me, trampling clouds, arching wings. I'm in a room, apartment, building, street, grid, taking form, comfort in long sentences, gliding through afternoons when the wind picks up, and wants, wants, wants to take you. A rescue, the revival of words. At the center of the sea, an island with remnants, Offerings to Apollo. Soon, shores will open onto themselves. Fabrics of fresh earth, tossed, drenched in salt water, airlifted. I am wanting to be the statue that leads pirates to destiny, half of a wooden city, body. Beirut is absent. We swim, make dinner, roasted chicken and laps at the sporting club. My cousin writes a long email about the traffic. Someone calls the embassy and begs to hang on to the fanning helicopter moving towards Cyprus. It's still too hot in the summer. Cars rush up the mountain. There's a name for that where the archeologist who falls in love with the object really falls in love. Like that woman who loved that piece of the Berlin Wall, like me and you and the city, this flammable object between us. Mannerisms and language slashes above A's, marks below long Y's. In reading Arabic, these are not printed, just understood. This is how you knew that you would leave before I do. Carpenter ants dig send tunnels on branches before hieroglyphic, Gilgamesh and cedar forest, before heaven and hell, we read their marks and bed our own. The paths are dense, our shadow a vaguely yellow light. Stand in place, wait. She says, I wish I could know what it will be like when the empire falls. Otherwise, she is quite polite. There's nowhere left to go. Your thumb keeps the page open and I walk closer. We surrender, statues becoming, I lurch closer. Tiny noises like pop rocks move across the side of the train, ignite in your mouth. I am not far from electricity. You remain constant, hold open. Why does anyone come to this country? Mouth a gap, fly trap, or stem of lights? A city is only as good as its satellite dishes and yo te amo is a big, big word. I tell you, as the seal moves slowly towards us, slick mass of muscle and a cartoon smile on the beach where buildings recede behind chlorinated pools. We are famished. Eat some busik and tabule. You tear the lettuce leaves. Give me the curl. Say she who is heart will fight. Recollect everything. Comments about memory, lines, big gesturing hands. Puffy, you reel yourself in, you stand up. The surge I felt when you recognize me. Light has no other function than to emanate. 
spaces like dismembered limbs outside, branches are hanging by threads, red toppled dirt, the salt, the earth. That night, a hunter moon. The almanac suggests fattening the deer on the beach years ago, a carcass. These are the ghosts, what they smell like. 10,000 emergency phone calls. In Chunking Express, the 10,000 incomprehensible streets went on forever. I look it up. If each neuron connects to 10,000 others, then there is no difference between inside and out. The body is revived. Underwater, the tunnels gasp for breath. Light flickers like gulps. We clobbered them, you said, sweaty, magnificent. Triumph arrives with the smell of grass and mud. I didn't move from the sofa and let you take over the room. When you walked away, I imagined a being that had grown too large from love. Um, I think that's what I'm, I'll, um, I'll stop there with this, um, with this work. Um, and then I'm just going to read uh, a new piece because I feel like that's what readings are. <laughs> a moment to kind of um, put into the world the things that are currently on your mind. Um, and uh, this is uh, a piece that's connected to an art project that was about the 17th century Scandinavian witch trials um, and uh, sort of about its relationship to our current language around migration. Um, and so when I was doing an art project, um, uh, I, I did two of them, both in Scandinavia, but both were sort of about um, these larger questions of how the witch hunts and the language used and the, um, the reasons used for accusing uh, specific parts of the population um, at a time of massive change um, and how those things reflect on the contemporary moment. Um, and as soon as you begin reading it, you really understand that not a lot has changed <laughs> um, uh, in terms of really wanting to identify specific groups of people to explain the unexplained. Um, so, uh, uh, and to explain crisis. Um, and so uh, at this, so this is a piece that's uh, kind of part of a project that happened uh, looking at the very local flora and fauna um, in upstate New York um, near Bard, which is where the, this specific show was um, in relation to to that, um, to those witch trials. Um, and it's called Manifest. Even the rocks draw make marks appear like claw scratches of time and ice. During times of panic, you will be asked to control the sea so they do not swallow you. The test you hope to fail. You can make stones talk. If only it were true. There's so much to know. What is a normative plant? Stuck to your shoe, gum, or invasive species? What are the tasks of the citizen species? Do they observe, trace, and track migration? Birds tracked on a hemispheric scale. The good citizen who finds clues, takes a photo, expels the aliens, protects the natives, the bees are in fact immigrants. Bees breathe in the breeze, breathe, bee, breathe. Winter bees are fed sugar and honey stirred slowly over a stove, granulated. Clip the old queen's wings. You can find scissors online, their shape unafraid of sound. If the bees do not swarm, your neighbors will not be alarmed. She draws dismantled bee legs, antenna, hairy, crunchy, creepy. Is it quiet in a beehive, a camp? We were never friends before, now neighbors by circumstance. 
who will draw us to make sure we are not forgotten. We ask children to illustrate they respond with distorted lines and primary colors. This will have to do. Pro dispersal. Yes, disperse plant, grow. Teach the use of the flower. Do this by bringing in all flowers possible. As it fades, the fruit becomes evident. You are magic. Like excavated rhizomes growing after months without water, seeds germinating after being burnt in the late summer. Transfer of power happens in togetherness, morphing into goats, cats, shape shifting. We test our cities for their ability to mutate. What if our neighbors did too? Would you accuse them? Marvel at their skills? You gained your power in a piece of bread and butter. Was it delicious? Salty? Was the bread tough and aged? Sometimes it's in the fish. Come to tea, dance with me. If so, many of us, we collect moments. A bee is a social gathering. Which bee, a bee which? If particles are manifestations of a deeper process, then scale is simply unfolding. If scale is not still, neither are we. Attention and empathy are intertwined. Entanglement is, well, let's see what the declaration says. Non-human animals, including mammals and birds, including octopuses, possess these same neurological substrates. What is a stranger bird? 150 million sparrows. And what a flight. The young grasshopper looks like the old one, except the wings are shorter, same as crickets, to denounce, accuse, to name, to point, to find the homes of engraver beetles under bark. In the future, will we train octopus to tell species apart? Let's go. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. That was amazing. It was a lovely range. <laughs> range of voice and range of tone of things that you offered us. Thank you. <laughs> really appreciate it. <laughs> Um, next up, we have Megan. Megan Fernandez is the author of Good Boys, which <coughs> excuse me, came out with Tin House 2020. Her work has been published or is forthcoming in the New Yorker, American Poetry Review, and Plowshares, among many others. Fernandez is an assistant professor of English and the writer in residence at Lafayette College. She lives in New York City. Thank you so much, Megan, for joining us. Appreciate it. Thank you, and oh gosh, I've lost my voice. And uh, thank you to all the writers uh, who came before me. I'm in the unhappy position of having to go after all of you, but I wanted to say a special thank you um, to Rita and to Sarah uh, for organizing this wonderful group of people. Um, I'm gonna read about two poems and then I'm gonna read some a little bit of prose uh, just to give you um, a heads up. I always think it's nice at the jump to say what you're gonna do because I love poetry and even I'm like, okay, yeah, poems, let's go, all right. So this first poem is called, um, Do You Sell Dignity Here? And it was published recently in, this, in the Los Angeles uh, Review of Books. Um, by recently, I mean, you know, 2020. Time doesn't exist anymore, so. Do you sell dignity here? Do you know what aisle they sell dignity? I say to the store clerk on University Avenue. It is a cold October. Frank Ocean's Moon River croons in my head. And earlier that day, I lay flat in the bathtub like a wild infant, shower pouring, thinking of that Dickinson poem where she says, a bomb upon the ceiling, it is an improving thing. Steam gathering in celestial curls. And I imagine bombs fizzing out gas and me radioactive with love. At the grocery store, I ask where they sell dignity. And when the clerk says, sorry, what'd you say? 
I explained that I'm looking for dignity, having lost so much in the last year, and was wondering if it was neatly placed by the baking powder or perhaps refrigerated with the perishables given its fragile shelf life. And yes, I really did ask this partly because I was being funny and trying to make a friend, but also I would have taken a hug or any acknowledgement that I am a person who can laugh at myself despite walking with that odd angle of defeat. Children have no dignity, and I really admire that about them. I love their ruthless response to injustices, their desire to feed birds in the park, to breathe the sea, their right to be tired in public. Do you sell dignity here? I ask one last time and then tell them how it went down, how I had lost mine in Bushwick of all places, near a building covered in glass and white girl gentrifiers having their white girl epiphanies, such bad coming of age trash. Jesus, all my parents' sacrifices for this, for what? Is this why I came here all the way from Africa? They would say over my flat body, hopefully in the shape of a shrug. I am undignified. I pray on fluorescent light. I enter through the automatic door of grocery stores with royal glide feetless into an even white. I greet peaches and body cauliflower nod to the pink packets of sweeteners and wrapped meat thighs. I am drawn to the milks and oblong fruit, dent a red Campbell can of soup. I want everything as cheap and damaged as this feeling. When they go low, we go high, a president's wife said. I go low some days. I go so low you cannot tell me from the animals we sell, from the hard grain my body has become. Um, they're all bummers, sorry. And I've also realized that I just like been wearing the same Aaliyah t-shirt for every reading. So I'm very much looking forward to like some future going back to this year and seeing all these recordings and like, just being like, did she have another shirt? Maybe she didn't, it's fine. Um, I'm going to actually uh, read a new poem um, that I wrote really recently, uh, just because, yep, this is reading. I've never read this out loud, and why not? So it's called Letter to a Young Poet in 2021, and it's a very aphoristic text, just like a bunch of advice. Letter to a Young Poet in 2021. If you haven't taken the Amtrak in Florida, you haven't lived. At 2 a.m., seven months into the pandemic, I'm looking up where Seamus Heaney died. It was Black Rock Clinic overlooking the sea, and I wonder sometimes, what is my thing with the Irish? But if the white kids can go to India for an epiphany, maybe it's fine that I can go to Ireland. Don't read Melanie Klein in a crisis. She's depressing, and there are alternatives like Winnicott or a lobotomy. Flow is better understood through Islamic mysticism or Little Wayne spitting without a rhyme book post-2003. To want the same things as you age is not always a failure of growth. Your moral compass is often a superior bitch. Don't listen to her. A good city will not parent you. Every poet has a love affair with the bridge. Mine is the Manhattan and she's a middle child. Or the sea link in Mumbai her galactic tentacles whipping the starless sky. When I say bridge, what I mean is goddess. People need your ideas more than your showmanship. LA is ruining some of you, but also there are worse things than fuck boys. All analysis is revisionist. Yellow wildflowers are it. It is better to be illegible sometimes than they can't govern you. It takes time to build an ethics, go slow. Wellness is a myth and shame transforms no one. Everyone should watch anime after a heartbreak. Sleep upwards in a forest so the animal sees your gaze. I think about that missing plane sometimes, unrecovered, wrecked deep into the cold ocean. Pay attention to what disgusts you. Some of the most interesting people have no legacy. Remember that green is your color and in doubt, read Brooks. In the end, your role is to attend to the things you like and ask for more of them. Bridges, ideas, destabilization, yellow tansy, cities, fuck boys, death by sea. And in the absence of recovery, some ritual. In the absence of love, ritual. Understand that ritual is a kind of patience in awaiting and waiting. Keep waiting, kittens. You will be surprised what you can come back from. And um, I'm going to end with this piece. It's a letter. Uh, and during the pandemic, one of the things I really did was I wrote a lot of letters. And I'm a letter writer. 
um, especially if I'm stuck and I was really stuck as many of us were, and it felt strange to write. And one of my favorite pen pals was Taylor Johnson, who's a poet out in New Orleans, um, is from DC. Their recent book is Inheritance. It won the Alice James Book Prize. Uh, it's an amazing book, you should get it. And Taylor and I would just write back and forth about what it was like to be in the protest. I was in New York. I was alone for a couple months in New York. Uh, during the summer, they were alone for a couple months in, in New Orleans and just talk about our cities. And we talked a lot about shame and that shame comes from the word shelter and what it meant to want to get cover at the moment of exposure. We talked a lot about interracial intimacy. So you're gonna see that in the letter. Um, we talked about what is a line in different disciplines like film and painting. And lastly, this is like only important for you to know ahead of time, because I mentioned it really briefly. Uh, Taylor talks about this moment of being in New Orleans and all his neighbors who were white putting up Black Lives Matter signs um, or uh, big flags, right? And talked about, you know, what does cover really mean? Because what does it mean when Bank of America is also putting up those signs? Like, what does cover look like and the relationship between wanting to be covered and using and the neoliberal neoliberalization, right, of cover um, in these moments through protest. So it's a letter and uh, it's all over the place. So, Dear Taylor, Dear Taylor, I'm reading Christina Sharp right now and about aspiration and lungs. And it seems to me as an asthmatic kid who has lived in a number of heavily polluted cities that we don't really talk about lungs enough and that there's something here, something for a poet to say, maybe you, about the relationship between breath, breath as in lungs, the way breath is discursive now in our racial politics, our landscapes made of stolen air. I once saw a talk by a professor at McGill, a queer Asian American person named Bobby. The talk was on Instagram twinning in the queer community, a phenomena where white queer men dating each other flex about how much they look like twins and take the joke even further by dressing like each other. Bob said that this was a cover for white supremacy and homonationalism, that the kinship of twins, of siblings, which can only really happen within one race, replaces the nuclear family model of heteronormative couples. What does it mean when people dress alike and look alike and slowly want to become each other and when all difference is eclipsed? And Bobby was like, yeah, that shit is just about racial homogeneity. That's the fantasy of queer twinning, queer twinning, even if people don't want to say it. The idea is that you don't need a kid now to reproduce yourself. You just did. I've been reading about my family and South Asians in East Africa, and it's pretty illegible to me what their presence means, except that they were administrators at least a few generations in, and that the British and Germans did a good job of keeping everyone separate, the Gons and the Shmalis, and of course the Tanzanians, with separation, also hierarchy. I had a dream that I had a baby and it was a girl and she had black spiky hair, but on the edge of each spiked hair was orange, like she had frosted ginger tips, except they were natural. What the fuck is that about? People were disgusted by her in the dream, like she was an alien. And I fell into such a sadness because when I looked at her, she was beautiful to me, a little star, something spidery. I think her name was Eulalia, Eula for short, my aunt's name. So funny, these dream structures. I met a woman in Shanghai last year who made me think of becoming a vegetarian. We lived together in an artist residency and I remember her once saying to me that in a hundred years from now, people would look back on us eating meat and think it was something unspeakable. She said it like it was prophecy. She was a filmmaker from Hong Kong originally and we went to Lushuan Park one day and she took my phone and started recording. And I remember how she walked in a line, the pace of her walk, the slight swerve around one man who looks into the camera as older people sang and played music. She was able to catch the emotional energy of that moment almost through this dance. And I remember thinking, is this what a line is to a documentarian, a path through space? We usually don't get to see the footwork of a camera person, but it reminded me of the footwork of a boxer, elegant, technical, its own flow, her ankles were musical. I remember reading this piece by Gwendolyn Brooks called How I Told My Child About Race. Brooks writes about taking a walk with her five-year-old son around the University of Chicago and getting pelted by rocks by six to seven white men who use the N-word. And she wrote, quote, formerly I had felt that if any place at all was safe, it was the university district mecca of basic enlightenment and progressive education. I'm actually gonna just put the quote in the chat so you can look at it. What gets me is Brooke's attention to buildings and actual violence of infrastructure. She does this in the book, 
in her book in the Mecca as well, where the apartment building in Chicago becomes a vernacular. I also think about Sidia Hartman's work on sexual geography and her read on the kitchen as brothel and family albums, aborted futures, June Jordan's work on urban planning, how she wrote that piece about the width of sidewalks in Harlem and how folks in Harlem were getting clipped by cars because the city built the sidewalks dangerously narrow. This aligning of black feminist spatial logics and racist state violence, Hartman's waywardness as the path that insists on its own deviation, a line that deviates, a method gone, gone errant. I love a poet who is also an architect. I was talking to my friend Randy last night and she said something about the neoliberalization of protest, how the neoliberal in us wants us to do something all the time, even if we're unclear on what the fuck we're doing. She also said that we're, that what's something that stuck with me when I shared thoughts about Sarah Ahmed and shame and your neighbors with their BLM flags. She said out on the streets, we see what cover actually looks like when white people put their bodies between black people and the cops and that's real cover. Then we talked for three more hours, much of the time about Wayne and Southern orality, but also outcast the first time we heard players ball, how they got booed at the 95 Source Awards. I told her I was reading a lot of Etheridge Knight and his toast telling poems, long and dramatic memorized pieces about all sorts of exploits, usually to homosocial audiences. I said, I liked that they were site specific and full of characters, that maybe there's some linked history to this kind of poetics and orality all the way up to Wayne's mixtapes. One white person I love threw her body at a cop rushing the crowd and got tackled, beat and maced. She texted me that night bleary eyed against about the worst headache of her life. After some conversation, she said she was going to bed and I replied, hopefully not forever because I don't know what's funny anymore, but she did laugh. A few days later, she was headed to another protest and she asked if she could put my number on her arm in case anything happened. Just a year ago, we were kicking it, watching Serena Williams or walking through the park after a Japanese play. Now all this. I've been thinking about how all my interracial intimacies are swelling and shrinking in this moment against the background of the city's wide whipping surrealism and blue compounded griefs. Sometimes in the middle of the day, in the middle of the street, I just start laughing unhinged until, until the sound coming out of my mouth is not laughter anymore. Thank you. Damn, that was stunning. That was a, yeah, that was a great ride you just took us on. I would love to see you standing up and just being that full physical presence rather than the Zoom presence. I think there's an energy there. That really well, I'm cool. wearing boxers, so actually this is a good <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> Thank you all, that was really, uh, amazing night with everyone here tonight so thanks each and every one of you really appreciate it um just to remind people that in the chat um rita's been adding links to everyone's books so you can look and see what they've got um you can look at their websites and uh you can always let me know if you have any questions i'll email you back too so um, we're going to open it up a little bit just for this end uh, little section with some questions and answers if anyone in the audience has any questions. Um, one thing I wanted to ask was um, given how it's sort of an open question to anyone, um, given how the world's opening up again, I mean even I feel it in very rural little New Mexico where I am, you know there's that sense of possibility and change and yet I see um, America going back down into all of the, the mass shootings, like the amount of things that, that it's a seesaw. But I was wondering if there's anything um, within the COVID, post-COVID world, is there anything that's really inspiring you into new work? Are you seeing any momentum in your own work? How about you, Megan? We'll start with you. <laughs> Oh, wow. Okay. You put me on the spot. Um, yep. Wow. Uh, I would <laughs> say, you know, it's so interesting. I actually was so compelled by during the pandemic of reading about underworlds and afterlives. So it was like really want, lovely to hear your work, Ken, and thinking about Philip B. E. Williams' uh, forthcoming book, Mutiny, which also deals a little bit with that. So there was a, a little bit of like a return to myth and thinking about, um, 
the complexities of that. So that was something I was doing a lot in the pandemic. And now I would say that like one thing that's really helping me or kind of uh, inspiring me is the ability to just be outside more, which obviously sounds, it sounds really obvious, but I've been like looking at the city through a window, through a courtyard, you know, through um, a fire escape and thinking about these kind of semi outdoor spaces um, and just not taking really that for granted. It sounds so basic, but, um, you know, this, my relationship with the city has been completely transformed uh, in this past year. Um, and I realized that uh, a lot of that is because I sort of moved with a compulsive protagonism through it. And so moving slower through it and like really taking in, you know, oh, that elm tree like went down in like the storm in August and now it's no longer here. Like I kind of sense what's missing and what's new there. You know, businesses that have gone out uh, that have sort of disappeared. Um, people who have been like evicted, uh, the whole geography I think has changed. And that has given me a lot of momentum, I think in my own work, not so much to document, but to sort of feel in transition of what it means to not wanna go back, but wanna sort of take stock of what's transformed in that space. I was not prepared for this question. So that's, <laughs> that's as good as I can do right now. Do you think it's changing like how you're writing, how you're creating? I hope so, if that makes sense. Yeah, I hope so. We'll see, maybe ask me in a year. If I'm, if I'm writing the same kind of poems in a year, you know, just slap me. But uh, I really do hope that um, not only is the work changing, but I think my relationship to the professionalization of creative writing and poetry has really changed. And just like being like, what does a meritocracy even mean if like half of my, most of my friends, <laughs> don't have health insurance or most of my friends, right, don't have the basics to survive. Like what, what is the relationship with art there and poetry there? So um, yeah, hopefully it'll transform the work, but more hopefully it's gonna change some social infrastructural things around us that make work possible. Mm -hmm. I can see that. Does anyone else, Ken or Yumna, do you feel like the, the opening up of the world is changing how you're seeing things or creating? <laughs> um, we, we've both been vaccinated, but we actually haven't just FYI, T, TMI maybe. Um, but I, I don't think it's actually changed anything that um, we've, any of our behaviors, you know, and, um, and maybe that's like an unintentional, like personal version of like, like the pre-existing world before the pandemic not being normal and not wanting to go back to the, the abnormal normal. And, um, you know, I think th this has been a like very ambiguous time and that we've had a lot of um, like personal time. It's like been this strange sort of like cloistering. Um, and uh, I, I think it's also a time of like trying to understand like what is your what is the perimeter of your horizon? Like whatever that means, like whether it means like temporally into the future, uh, whether it means like politically, um, like there's the, you know, Aaron W. Roy famously was saying like the pandemic is a portal. And I think like at the beginning of it, I was very like apocalyptic and hopeful at the same time. And I thought that there would be this sort of like switch where every place in the world would become like, uh, like Keynesian, you know, like New Deal types, and there would be like a complete transformation of society. And I think the thing that's like weird is that like the apocalypse and like the weird rescue attempt to the apocalypse can happen at the same time. So I think it's been like disappointing on how like little things have changed. Um, and I think on a more personal level, I mean, I think the, these are like big things, but they are like ways of marking like your sense of like how you can be a person or how you can be empowered or something or what agency can you ascribe to yourself. And um, I think that, uh, I feel like I've been more aware of like my, how these things correlate to like embodied states I might have, you know, like I feel like writers are traditionally people who are very disembodied and, um, I feel like one way of dealing with this situation is like uh, dissociation, you know? And so 
in some ways that's like productive, but it's also like avoidant behavior, you know? And so um, I think sometimes, you know, it, I think it's in, like been like this uh, hyperactive, like um, the stress of the, the reality of the world and like the, the bleakness of it has been kind of like a, um, like, you know, this kind of like ADD, like thing that you internalize. But then I think there are ways where you're forced to just be present um, and like kind of in the way that Megan was describing in terms of like just being in a park or like, um, you know, having a way of like being unproductive. I don't know, what, what do you think about it? <laughs> I, um, yeah, and I, I think just to add a little something, um, it's funny, Megan, the way you described like the oak tree, um, um, I, I, I think when I notice myself um, being really surprised at like the spring blooms, like, whoa, <laughs> like there's been a return, um, you know, like really noticing the minutia of the city and, and, um, and who, who planted that, you know, those little daffodils on the corner <laughs> um, and who and how, how come that tree was able to be green again? I think um, these are things that I took for granted. It sounds, it's kind of what you said, it sounds so basic. It sounds so um, uneventful, but I think sort of being in one place for so long as someone who, um, hasn't ever <laughs> been in one place for so long um, and and really being um, in one place and noting these small things because uh, the kind of biggest breath you could take is a walk outside. Um, and so so it, it really has transformed like the way I move through the city and the way I move um, through spaces. Um, I think uh, I think you can tell yourself all you want as a writer and artist that you're kind of in the world and you notice things. <laughs> but um, but I think this last year and a half or whatever it's been um, has really shifted like what I notice um, and what I want to spend time with. Um, not just who I want to spend time with, like where I want to spend my time, how I want to spend it. And I don't think I'm clear on all those things and I think I just am aware that I move differently um so that's kind of nice <laughs> yeah yeah it's that slowing down somehow it's you know we're contained in these limited worlds that we have been for the last year and a half almost and how you know how does that affect what goes in and what comes out because Usually we have more stimulus, but our stimulus is so focused now. Like you're saying, you look at the the buds coming out and you notice the details. So it's sort of fascinating. Erica, have you anything you wanted to add to the opening up world conversation? I don't really have anything found to say about the pandemic. No, it hasn't affected my writing life. Um, I did read that suicide rates for white people have come down. Um, I don't know, do with that with what you will. Uh, I think mainly right now, I'm thinking a lot about, obviously the pandemic is all the stuff we've discussed and death and loss of jobs and all these kinds of things. Um, but I guess selfishly what's kind of on my mind is that for, for a long, 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 long time in the Native American fiction world, it was like one guy at a time. And sometimes that guy was a lady, um, but you know there was only one important Native American writer at the time. At a time, for a long time, that was obviously Alexi, without getting into his um, incendiary behavior. Um, and now, and for for a while there, it looked like that was being sort of handed over to Tommy Orange. Like, oh, now it's just Tommy Orange. And I don't. I. I <laughs> it's why I've written a lot of articles about the Native American Renaissance, which you know has kind of been a phrase used in, in, in many turns. But I'm trying to make sure that right now that happens for real. So if you want to Google my name and BuzzFeed, um, you can see like there are now a plethora of Native American fiction writers getting contracts with bigger presses. Do without what you will, and with presses like Grove. 
and Ten House. And I think it, for me, um, what's been on my mind is, you know, this sense that maybe there'll be a real sense of community amongst Native American writers and from my world fiction writers. And that maybe in the non-Native world, it won't be like, oh yeah, I've read Tommy Orange, I'm done now. You know, so we're not gonna be just sort of like, I've done this like check mark, read the, read the Native, I know they exist and here's the one I'm supposed to read. And so that's, I, I guess, been on my mind for so long. It's um, it kind of, yeah, it sort of, it doesn't supersede the pandemic obviously, but that's, that's the big thing for me right now. Um, anyone else have any questions? Rita? Yeah, I have a question, which is, um, I think I saw um, this pattern emerging in, in many of the works, whether they're poems or fiction, um, this kind of, you know, not only grappling with the underworld, but um, grappling with like a dreamlike trance like state. And I'm just wondering, um, how do you approach that? Because there is this kind of um, deep engagement with the unknown, whether it's something supernatural, you know, or um, it's uh, an interpretation of history or an interpretation of um, agency, trauma, popular terms, you know, that we're using right now that have a lot of cultural capital. How are you um, dealing with that in your work? And, and, and does, um, you know, do trans states or like, you know, do you get into kind of almost like a dream like atmosphere when you're writing? Like, how are you producing these texts? Like, what's the inspiration um, for your contact with the unknown? And anyone can jump in. I realize it's a big question, but anyone can jump in. So. I guess I, I mean, I'm the wrong person because um, what I'm gonna say is that for me, I don't do poetry anymore, um, but I did um, publish a couple of books and I think that helps me to access that world um, a bit better. For me, um, also when I wrote Buckskin Cocaine, what I imagined was, would there be a scenario, an imagined scenario in which um, if you could get somebody, somebody's selves to speak completely honestly, or at least one of their selves to speak completely honestly, what, the, what would the approximation of that look like? You know, um, if you could get someone to just, you know, their inner monologue was like, you know, all the things we repress even in our, most basic, what, what does that look like? And I think I still utilize that to this day, obviously, in, in some of my fiction. So I'm interested in, in that voice in that space. Anyone else would like to jump in? I would, I would say that, um, you know, Mina Alexander has this great opening line of a poem, I think it was called like birthplace of buried stones or something. Um, and she says, in the absence of reliable ghosts, I made an aria. And I always think of that, like in the absence of reliable spectrality, which is like a way of trying to figure absence or loss. I made a song, which is, you know, what I think poetry is essentially is um, trying to sort of, uh, it's a way of thinking about longing and kind of in almost like literal uh, in sort of like a literal sense. Um, and yeah, I don't know. I've just been thinking a lot about uh, what in lyrical poetry, what happens when the beloved becomes abstract? You know, how do we create fantasy structures um, in which the relationship between the speaker and beloved is not one that is conquest oriented, right? Um, which is so much of the history of lyrical poetry. And I think that that trance like, kind of space allows you to move into a fantasy structure that is parallel to the reality you live in, not projected into some kind of futurity where you want things to be different, but like this almost sort of like entertainment of like kind of other dimensions um, that I think about a lot when I'm, when I'm writing poetry. And I would also say that I think a lot of diaspora writers are very invested in that. And that happens when your homelands are somewhat kind of theoretical, right? Or um, you have all these very confusing colonial histories uh, that that's a way of sort of rooting yourself, not in an actual time and space, right? Um, but maybe rooting yourself 
um, in something that feels a little more dreamlike because that you, that's where you feel truthfulness or meaning or kinship can lie. Thank you. Um, uh, I feel like there are a lot of directions to go. Uh, well, first of all, I, I was actually just teaching Mina Alexander's Fault Lines mm -hmm. and I was gonna email you, Meg, because there's this great essay that um, you wrote that's sort of about her work and like thinking about it as someone from like, like part of the reason I picked the book, you know, it, it's great, et cetera, et cetera. It's also, I wanted to teach someone who was like writing a kind of diasporic and migrant narrative, but that was like intrinsically non-nationalistic. And, um, and, and then, so it was great to like encounter your, your essay in this sort of like roundup of people writing, um, these like elegies because, uh, Mina Alexander Pastor is a South Asian writer who, um, grew up in, in Kerala and in Sudan, and she passed away um, like two years ago. And her memoir, Fault Lines, is like really interesting because for a number of reasons, um, you know, it's about a coming of age story. It's like a third world woman's book. It's also about being migrant. Um, it's also a like bildungsroman of like how I became a writer. Um, and, but I think one thing that's really interesting about it is that it's in this mode, it, of public and private. It's like a very dreamy book, but it's also a very like book intrinsically about like gender and colonialism and like the history of nationalism and, um, you know, third world movements, you know, in the post-war period. And I feel like there's something that's very conscious that's happening in the book where she is taking you to a space where she is dreamy or she's dissociating. There's often a lot of scenes where she's encountering something that's very tra traumatic, maybe about sexual violence or maybe about the difficulties of being not having a home. And then she like spaces out. And then the next paragraph will be about her having like an argument about Fanon or something. And I think one thing that's interesting is that I feel like um, I'm increasingly noticing writers who are able to like traverse the span between like the public and the private. And so like, uh, like it was cool to see the moves, Meg, that you were doing in your essay about like walking down the street and thinking about things on a structural level and then laughing, you know, or like appreciating beauty, you know? And I think um, I, I increasingly noticed the ways where sometimes like, even a, like a writer who's very political, whose politics I might like, like there's a way where the personal is like completely alighted. And I feel like that's where it, the other critique is more obvious, where there's like a lyric writer and there's no world beyond the like interiority, you know? And so I think what's fascinating about me and Alexander's work, but about like what I've been trying to think about in terms of like the meaning of the trance maybe is like, what would be a way of writing where you have, I'm trying to actually think, I was actually at, before, at the beginning of this talk trying to think like, what would be a name for this way of writing where you can be a whole self that is both public and private. and I, I feel like usually it's a case where the trance state or the like a dream state is something that is designated as entirely subjective or entirely private. So like I, one thing I've been thinking a lot in my project is like, what would it mean to have a uh, mode of dreaming that is more um, uh, or a mythology that is more uh, like public in nature, you know, and uh, I did a one, an event once with uh, Norbese Philip, who, uh, you know, has a lot of writing around like the history of the Caribbean or the Middle Passage. And she was like, you know, I, I always feel like I have to justify like avant-garde writing or like the political impact of like surrealism. And then she was like, but then I realized like I have a dream, like it is itself like a kind of surrealism, you know? And so a lot of um, what I've been thinking about is how do I actually take things that are written from a very external place, like reading like colonial history of like any given place that is often from a very macro place. And then how do I um, preserve the information, uh, but then also have some take that is some thread of it that is more subjective. Um, and I feel like sometimes it's very dissatisfying for me to read the literature because there is no public aspect to it. But then when I read the, I, I think I've just become very good at like cramming large amounts of like historical information in my head, but that too has a kind of like unintentional uh, inhuman aspect where it's like, you know, history written from above, et cetera, et cetera. Um, 
Um, so I think it's been that that's been my challenge of like not having a trance feel like it's like a personal somatic state, but like how is a trance something that is like in interrelation or it's a trance, a trance of history. Um, I can just say uh, on TJ class about this, <laughs> um, about not knowing, um, but um, partly because um, I really am trying to understand the practice of it um, rather than the theory of it. Um, and so um, one of the ways, like as everyone's been talking, I've been thinking about it is um, rather, it's like if we think about this kind of fold that is the multiple dimensions of time and space, like what if we don't think about it as vertical, but we think about it as horizontal. Um, and so that horizontality doesn't allow for compression. So it's less about like uh, compressing all of these multiple things that we experience across spectrums and making them a volume. And it's more about a kind of opening across um, a horizontal line. Um, and that line is something I've been working towards a lot in my art practice, which is the horizon. So my entire practice for the last few years has been um, under this umbrella of the Museum of Future Memory. So it's taking this notion of the speculative um, and really um, moving it back to the moment. Um, and so, so for me, all these things, it's less about, um, so it's like, let's say the trance is the transparent paper. <laughs> That's not really right. You know, the trance is really solid and, um, and has weight and has presence. Um, it's not the place you go to when you want to abstract. Um, and, and how do we do that then? How do we do that with language? How do we do that with the way we tell stories or the way that we understand ourselves in a continuum or in a, in a moment even? So, so these are things um, that I think are, are really important to kind of like keep moving through. Um, Partly because um, the I partly because uh, the hesitancy has been to not name them, <laughs> um, and I understand that I'm not someone who believes in categorizing anything. Um, but um, I think maybe we need to come up with more names <laughs> so that everyone some every time someone writes like a dream scene in a, in a short story, we don't have to be like why does the dream really work here? You know, <laughs> like, um, and, and maybe we, we think in a kind of broader, bigger way about the many dreams and the many trances and the many, many, many. Um, so um, yeah, so for me, that's where all of that lives at the moment. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. Um, I'll just open up the floor to see if anyone else has um, any questions or comments. Any final questions? No? Okay, well, thank you so much. I want, I would love everyone to unmute for a moment and let's um, have some applause for our featured authors. So thank you, Megan. Thank you, Yuna and Ken. Thank you, Erica. Thank you, Ruben. Um, thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you guys for organizing this. Absolutely. I hope that post uh, vaccine, post pandemic, we actually have a chance to gather and uh, share thoughts and have a real literary salon. I would love to do that. And I'm honored to have um, all of you here tonight and, and just be in conversation with you all. It's, it's been such a great learning moment and um, the art has been powerful, haunting and devastating. So thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Have a good evening. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers. Bye.